We know this uh, for many reasons, and on this slide you can just see three examples of atypical brain development. The first, first is that a proportion of children with autism have larger head circumference. That's to say if you put a tape measure around the head, you would find that they have uh, above average size of head circumference. And when, it when you look more directly at what's causing that, it turns out to, to correspond or correlate with having heavier brains. This has been revealed through post-mortem studies, so the brain is heavier. And when you look at the fine uh, uh, neuropathology, that's to say looking at the cells in the brain, you find an increased density of neuronal cells in, in the autistic brain, uh, particularly in certain regions such as the limbic system associated with understanding emotions and with the experience of emotion. Um, the second point you can see on this slide is that one region of the brain in autism, the amygdala, is consistently reported to be abnormal in size, in volume. Uh, in some studies, it's found to be too big. In others, it's found to be too small. But um, the, the consistent message is that this particular structure in the brain, again, involved in understanding emotions and in the experience of emotion, is not developing in the usual way. The final point on this slide is to do with the neurotransmitter serotonin. Um, what's been found in a range of studies is that in a proportion of children with autism, serotonin is elevated. So there's uh, too much of this particular neurotransmitter. For all these reasons, we can dispense with the old view that autism is purely the result of inadequate parenting. And uh, as, you, as you may know, for many years, parents felt very guilty that their child was not developing normally. What we can see very clearly is that autism is a medical condition affecting brain development. The other major fact I want to highlight is that autism is genetic. And there is no real doubt about this fact anymore. And on this slide, you see a lot of different um, uh, pieces of information which together have, uh, have put together the, the, the pieces of the puzzle so that we now understand autism to be genetic. The first, at the top of the slide, comes from twin studies. When you study twins, where one has autism, and you look at the likelihood of the other twin, do they also have autism, in identical twins, um, MZ twins as they are shown here, uh, in identical twins, the likelihood of the other twin also having autism is very high. It's about 60%. Whereas in non-identical twins, they're referred to here as DZ, it's much lower. It's about 5%. And that difference between 60 and 5% strongly suggests that autism is genetic because identical twins share 100% of their genes. Now, the fact that even amongst identical twins, we don't see a 100% concordance rate or correspondence between the two twins means that there must be some environmental factor. But the fact that identical and non-identical twins differ uh, in their rate of concordance for autism points very much to the role of genes. The second uh, part of this slide just lists a whole set of genes that have been found in recent years uh, which differ in terms of the frequency of these genes in people with autism compared to people without autism. So almost week by week, different genes are being reported. And what this means is that there is no single gene that causes autism. What we're discovering is that autism is polygenic. It involves many genes. We don't know how many will eventually um, be sufficient to explain or predict that a child will have autism. And you may know that even this week, um, there was a, a research uh, finding that came out of UCLA uh, reporting a new gene that was, uh, that was found in association with autism. So these are genes that affect brain development and brain function, 
and are pointing to autism being genetic. Other kinds of studies carry out what's called linkage, and you'll hear a bit more about this from one of our later speakers, uh, where you look to see which regions of the genome are linked to having autism, and they're pointing to different chromosomes containing autism susceptibility genes. Uh, there's one particular chromosome that pops up in many studies time and time again, which is chromosome 7. Um, but what, what, what this is telling us from many different angles is that autism is genetic. And the final clue to autism being genetic comes from family studies, where you look at siblings, at brothers and sisters, where there's already one child with autism in the family. And you ask the question, what's the likelihood of other children, other siblings in the family, also receiving a diagnosis? And it turns out to be significantly higher than the general population rate. So that's telling us autism runs in families for genetic reasons. What I wanted to do next was pick up on something that Ira mentioned, that we've been looking at the areas of difficulty in autism and the areas of strength. So the areas of difficulties, um, social development, communication development, and putting yourself into somebody else's shoes to imagine somebody else's mind. And I'm going to show you some research which suggests that these difficulties all derive from a, the psychological process of empathy being able to empathize with another person. So here's the definition of empathy. It's the ability to identify another person's thoughts and feelings, so imagining what somebody else might feel or think, but also to respond to somebody else's thoughts and feelings with an appropriate emotion. This was one way that we tested uh, even low-functioning children with autism for their ability to imagine somebody else's thoughts, we showed them two puppets in a little story, Sally and Anne, and we told them a little story, and then we asked them a test question. So we told them that Sally touches the box, and then we told them that Anne looks inside the box. That's the whole story, very, very simple, very short, and then we asked them the question, which of these two people knows what's inside the box? Now, the normal three-year-old passes this test by picking Anne. They know that because she looked, she knows what's in there. So they're already imagining somebody else's mind. They're putting themselves into somebody else's shoes to figure out what somebody else knows and thinks. When we gave this test to children with autism, they were at chance. They were guessing they were as likely to pick Sally as to pick Anne. So they were having a lot of trouble in identifying somebody else's thoughts. We've also gone on to look at emotion recognition in children on the autistic spectrum who are more high functioning. And this is a test where we just show people photographs of the eyes, the eye region of the face, because the eyes turn out to contain a lot of information about how somebody else feels, emotional expressions. So in this test, you are shown the photograph and you're asked which of the four words around the photo best describes what the person in the photo is thinking or feeling. So you have to pick one of these four words um, to identify another person's emotions. And here the person in the photo is uh, meant to be interested in something Many of you may agree, looking at them, that that's the correct choice. What you can see at the bottom of the slide is some data from some boys who are in the typical population and then some boys who have Asperger's syndrome. And um, the results, I'll see if I can get the mouse to highlight this, shows that the, the boys in the control group were scoring much higher than the boys with Asperger's syndrome in identifying how somebody else feels just from photographs of their eyes. We've also gone on to, to extend that test to adults. 
um, in, including adults with Asperger's syndrome who may have normal intelligence, but who may still have difficulties with empathy. So what do we see here? Um, again, photographs surrounded by the four words.